We'd like to welcome everyone to the Show Must Go On webinar, presented by Magic Productions. And now, here's your host, Michael Jerkin. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Magic Productions World Headquarters. My name is Michael Jerkin, and I'm here for episode number three of The Show Must Go On. Um, like I mentioned, I'm the president of Magic Productions. For those of you just joining us, either your first time or need a refresher of what we do here, I'll give you a brief history of what Magic Productions does and what we're all about. Uh, we were founded in 1999, and we focus in the production, events, and installation industry. Uh, we're based just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, north of Chicago for our international viewers. And we focus on sound, video, lighting, fabrication, and permanent installations. And we're a team of uh, technicians, programmers, designers, drafters, artists, builders, uh, all together here that focus on producing those events, small events, uh, very intimate events, which we'll talk about today, all the way to large events as well. Um, so just want to give you guys a brief agenda because I know everyone's time is valuable of what we hope to accomplish today. Um, first, we're going to recap kind of what we've done the first two episodes, give a brief industry update. And then, of course, the big part of today is a panel discussion. We have David Caruso with Dynamic Events by David Caruso and Ken Hudak with Canopy's Events as well, talking about, you know, those size doesn't matter, intimate. Uh, small 50 person or less events. And then lastly, of course, you know, question and answer for you guys. So just to recap, episode one, we talked about keys to successful webinar, if that even exists, because uh, nobody likes webinars. I can't emphasize that enough. We need live events. Um, they're much more engaging. Um, we talked about what events are going to look like, you know, immediately. And now we're kind of getting into that next period, especially locally here uh, in Wisconsin for us, of what some of those outdoor or drive-in events look like, which are kind of exciting to see come to fruition after we talked about them. Uh, we talked about also some of the long-term industry shifts as well. Episode two was really about F and B. You know, we talked about a lot of safety plans and uh, had a panel discussion with our friends at Marcus Resorts and Shelley's Cuisine and Events on what, how is the F and B industry going to be affected by this, and what are some of the things that they're doing uh, to go forward. So. Industry update, like I said, events are slowly starting to come back. Uh, I was just talking with our panelists before this, and you can really see people starting to really connect a lot more calls, a lot more you know, inquiries, a lot more unique ideas that people are really looking to ask to innovate. Um, and I think a lot of that's, you know, states are starting to slowly open back up and, you know, and get into dealing with the coronavirus and, and what life might look after that. So, but the one thing that is, you know, happening with a lot of these, if you're not doing an outdoor driving event, is you know these signature events at, at a lower capacity for at least immediate uh, future. So, if you followed us our first two episodes, uh, we've had a little special treat for each one. First week we had Dane, our operations manager, singing a song, and last week we had a little Cinco de Mayo uh, margarita instruction. Uh, but today we have design with Dan. So welcome Dan Grunts, who's our director of fabrication, who's actually back in our fabrication shop right now. And Dan's going to, we're going to follow, check in with him three different times here um, and see his progress. So uh, Dan, good to see you. And uh, what are you doing here? What are we making? Hello, everyone. I am going to be manufacturing or carving a US flag. Um, I have a mask on because it's extremely dusty process, the initial step. And I'm using an angle grinder, an Arbitec tool, and I'm roughing out the basic shape. Excellent. Well, Dan, that'll be fun to check back up on you and see how things are progressing throughout the day. Also give you guys some more arts and crafts ideas if you're looking to uh, make something at home. But obviously, that's probably going to be a little above my skill level. So um, very excited to get into our panel discussion today. Like I mentioned, that's kind of our meat and potatoes of today. So today, I'd like to, our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, first up, we have David Caruso from Dynamic Events by David Caruso. Uh, David, if you could please welcome and, and give a little background, a little bio about yourself. That'd be great. Hey, everybody. It is good to see you virtually. Thanks, Michael and the team here at Magic Productions for having us. I know a lot of people are tuning in, excited to hear about our size doesn't matter. But first, I just want to say hello and um, introduce myself a little bit. So Dynamic Events by David Caruso has the pleasure of producing small and large scale events all over the globe. Um, for the past 18 years, I have had my business here uh, based in the Third Ward, uh, downtown Milwaukee. So for me, it really is uh, my passion comes from collaborating with so many vendor partners and other creative people that really bring event experiences to life, weddings, other social parties, corporate events, 
um, and of course fundraisers for some of our favorite charitable partners uh, across the country as well. So we have been kind of, um, of course, staying at home and not doing much. So uh, really keeping up on information to share with all of you um, has been fun and exciting. And I look forward to a fun conversation today. Excellent. Size doesn't matter in <laughs> this <laughs> case, maybe. <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, David. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, up next, we have Ken Hudak, who is the, we like to call him the man in charge over at Canopy's events. Uh, and it was funny when we were rehearsing this today, Ken was joking how he could be both of our, you know, he's, he's watched us grow up in this industry and could be both of our, our parents. So uh, Ken, if you could give a little bit of the history about yourself and how did you get into this industry and, and what you've been doing today? Well, I got into this industry uh, uh, by accident, really, I guess, but yet I was training for it all my life. Um, Unfortunately, or fortunately, about 25 years ago or 21 years ago, I got involved with these two fellows, <laughs> and uh, that was quite a quite an advancement for me and, and uh, for Milwaukee in general. They both have done so much to raise the bar in the city and in this marketplace, and I'm excited to be here. Canopies has been in, in existence for 25 years, but prior to that, it's a fa it's a family business. We're all involved in it. And prior to that, we were working for another company for six and a half years. So we've got 30, over 30, 31 years in this business, in this marketplace. And I'm excited to be here because I see a lot of future. As Michael said in, this first, in his first webcast, is he's excited and there's a lot of opportunities. I agree with that. Yes, it's going to be different. Uh, there's no question about it in my mind, but I'm looking forward to it because I think it gives all of us a new opportunity to change things around a little bit and Go with the times. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that great intro, Ken. Um, so some panel topics we're going to be talking today, just in case you don't have any interest in this and you want to hop off. Um, we're going to be talking about, again, size doesn't matter. So how to execute these smaller events, but really signature, signature events with that wow factor. Um, talking about you know, what does some of that pre-event communication look like, whether it's involving invitations or safety plans or multiple dates. Um, going over the event layout, Ken Hudak is specifically, you know, event layout guru, ex expert. Um, what are some of these event layouts going to look like? And we have some other part images from other partners as well, kind of showing what some different ideas might look like. Um, how to use custom decor or lighting for an intimate event. Um, and also, will these initial events maybe be a hybrid event where you're going to have to have some sort of web streaming component to those? And lastly, of course, the importance of photography and especially videography during all this. Uh, for those guests who may not be able to attend, uh, you know, how does some a way to well document them for all of your guests who may not be able to be present? So. With that, I will open up the panel discussion. And again, a brief reminder, please feel free to use the Q&A form on this. Uh, for the first two episodes, that's really what drives a lot of this conversation. So please make sure to ask questions away. I'm monitoring them over here on a separate screen. And we'll get to those as well. So first question off to David. Um, David, do you think, you know, we t I mentioned briefly in my introduction that you know, the phone's starting to ring a little more. And, and I know we talked about it before. But is this kind of what we're going to be seeing a lot of these 50 person or 60 you know, person or under events kind of in this initial summer season? Well, I think it's definitely for now going to kind of be the default, at least for a while and the near future. But you know, I think that this conversation is going to be helpful because it's a good thing. It definitely allows for a lot of opportunity and possibility. I think even though it's by default, it's really going to allow, allow some clients to even spend and invest a significant amount of money in the small details and the overall experience. So I want to make sure that people understand it's kind of a misconception that smaller events mean smaller budgets. It really isn't always the case. And a lot of what we talk about today is going to be about how you can maximize your clients desires and objectives to create smaller event experiences for 50 people or less, but to still have a good revenue stream and to still make money off of the events while creating something that is really a special experience too. So I, I love these more intimate events and there's definitely ways to make sure that you can uh, guide your clients through the process so that they are really spending you know, good money to, to have a good party as well. Absolutely. Ken, do you agree you know, with, with the sentiment that David said? Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, I think a smaller event is, is the way it's going now. And uh, I think the opportunities are, are so great in, in, with a smaller event. 
And it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only going to be 50 people because we're already getting the, the, uh, the calls about doing something, a progressive wedding, mm -hmm. where maybe the ceremony is at a, a off-premise at a church or whatever the case may be. And then from there, they're going maybe to the bride's house for cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. And then they get on the, the bus and they go over to the groom's house for maybe dinner in the backyard or whatever the case may be. And then from there, they go someplace else. And that, that, that's a big opportunity for everybody. I think, Michael, yeah. one, that's a good point because one of the things that I think will be the biggest challenge coming out of this for industry professionals is that you are going to be forced to think differently and to be creative and to think outside of the box. And for many people, no fault of their own, you know, they're just used to doing things a certain way every week, every weekend, mm -hmm. and kind of repeating a pattern. And that just is not going to be an option. So like Ken was saying, it, this is going to throw all of that out of the window and it is now time to be innovative, creative, and to lean on each other to create these unique customized experiences um, together. And I think it's also, you know, it needs to be, like you guys briefly touched on, that it needs to be unique to your client. And you've really never been in a better spot now to, even if let's say you're a nonprofit organization, um, you know, let's say you're used to maybe hosting an event that's five, 600 people, you know, maybe now is the time too to focus on those 50, you know, VIP donors or, um, you know, for that side, but also, you know, your top performers as well um, as a company. And have you guys, you know, what are your thoughts about, doing, you know, if it is a corporate event, doing multiple nights, you know, your top, let's say you have a top 500 in your company, what are your thoughts about doing, you know, three separate nights? Is that a good way to do it? And 50 people each night for, for a corporate or a nonprofit event? I mean, I definitely think that that is one good option. Um, and just so the viewers know, Ken and I are just a, like eight feet away from <laughs> each other. So awkward. if we look at each other, it's because we're <laughs> sitting at the same place. Um, but anyway, the uh, I definitely think that creating a multi-day experience for um, especially some of these corporate events that are broken, a larger group broken up into smaller is, is for sure key. And really some of that comes down to selling, you know, um, and availability. How do you sell that concept to your clients and how do you know that you have the availability for them to have you know three days in a row at your property or your venue another good example Michael is that we are uh, getting ready to go down to Nevis for a president's club trip next February and um, there's a possibility that instead of doing it for uh, one one large group for four days that it might be um, two smaller groups back to back so one week the first group the second week the next group so it, you know it extends things but it's a way to not have to cut people out but to still have the experience but perhaps with two smaller groups but the multi-day thing i think is definitely something people are going to be taking advantage of too definitely so if the event trend or go ahead ken i agree a hundred percent because i think yeah and this gives us the opportunity to think out of the box and that's the challenge and boy i i'm excited about that opportunity no, that's awesome. So let's say we want to have one of these where either a social event or a corporate nonprofit. How, what do we start with? You know, what's kind of that pre-event communication? You know, how, what are some tips and tricks that we can do for that pre-event? Whether it's, uh, so twofold. One, you know, invitations. And two, also, do you need to communicate some sort of safety plan, you know, to these people? Or what are your thoughts on that? So pre-event. You know, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges because, to be quite honest, um, together as an industry, I think we're going to stumble through it a little bit um, as we're getting more and more used to the communication aspect. But this boils down to setting expectations. And this is what I think is key here, is that um, we absolutely are going to have to communicate to not only our clients, but to their guests about uh, things that they should expect and maybe prepare for. So people are going to want to know that if they are arriving to a function, if there is um, a different policy and procedure in place for sanitation, what have they done to take the proper steps? Are they going to be required to wear a mask? Or are they going to have a temperature check? Or whatever the case might be at that particular event or venue, setting the expectation ahead of time is going to be very, very key. You know, we were all talking earlier. Part of the issue is that 
you know, the general public is on a very wide spectrum of feelings as it relates to the current situation and getting back to business. So, you know, venues and catering people and everyone else are going to have to set policies and stick to it, and they're going to have to do an excellent job of commuting the, communicating the expectations to their clients and guests, for sure. I agree with that 100% also. Communication is everything. And I, I think we have to be in, take the lead and tell uh, people what can be done. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think it's we've never been in a position really more than now to really tailor to those guests. You know, with 50 people, if you're an organization, if you're a family wedding or, or corporate event, you should, you know, at least I'd like to hope so, that you'd have a fairly good idea of what those people expect, you know, how to communicate with them, as David mentioned, where they are on their comfort mm -hmm. or whatever risks, you know, uh, pre-existing pre conditions that might be a risk to them. Um, and so I think that for me, you know, having hosted a, you know, a under 50 person event a couple times, it's, it's really an awesome place to tailor everything to your guests, you know, and, and the person or the organization or the person uh, that you're honoring as well. So um, I think it's, you know, you can call, you can probably call all these people and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. Um, actually, just last week, we had a call with a corporate organization who had a uh, 50 person, you know, and they're like, oh, should we do it? It was, I think, in uh, September, October. And I was like, you know, I'm like, you probably, it was a corporate, I'm like, your sales reps, they probably can call these people and they have relationships with them. I'm like, ask them, you know, and they're like, oh, we didn't even think of that. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it a, gives a great opportunity to, to get into there. Uh, we'll ask another question here, and then we'll go back to Dan after this. But um, so now that we get to the event, what are we thinking for venues for these? What are some, you know, great venues um, can, you know, that you can, or layouts, or, you know, is it going to be mostly outdoors for the original part? I think it's going to be a toss-up. I think there's a lot of people that really want to have it at their house, but they weren't able to have a, a size property or a, a property that lends itself to putting a, a larger tent for the 200 people or 250 people or whatever the case may be. And this gives them the opportunity to do something special and just rearrange the plan of the whole evening or the whole day, so yeah, to speak. Definitely. And I think we'll, we'll get some examples of those uh, in a little bit here too, some layouts. All right, so design with Dan. Uh, let's see how we're doing on, if, if Dan's available, he might be in the middle of, of step two, but let's see how our American, oh, there he is. Let's see how his American flag is looking. Hello all. Hey, Dan. Um, to explain a little bit what's going on here, uh, I don't like visits to the uh, emergency room, so I have on my <laughs> safety equipment, Kevlar glove, Kev a wrist glove. Um, this is basswood. Uh, it's a very commonly used wood for carving. Um, I have some extremely sharp chisels. That's uh, essential to keeping them sharp during the process. Um, I like, I've, other than roughing out, you know, the initial step, I do everything by hand. I just, I have not uh, got the look that I want by using power methods. So I have a chisel, and um, if you can see, yeah. What I'm doing, uh, you can see the texture. Oh, the texture, look at that, yeah. And that's the look that, and almost all my all my stuff I do. That's the look I'm looking for. Excellent. Um, I've been doing this forever. So <laughs> I love it. Well, I we're don't. Excited to, yeah. I I, uh, I don't think about it. It's the medium I've chosen is wood, as opposed to painting, where I've it's I beat it to death too much. I just I don't think. I don't plan. I just go to it. And excited. It happens. Well, next time we check in, we'll see the finished finished results. So we're excited to see that. Um, and again, please at this time, you know, ask questions. We got some great, oh, they're just coming in right now too. So um, I'm trying to think. So we'll go through. So we talked about Ken, outdoor events are going to be, you know, big, especially. Um, and maybe David, now would be a good time too. You've had some experience kind of ex executing some of these intimate, you know, small gatherings for outdoor. I and mean, we're not talking like a barbecue, you know, which is <laughs> fine. Some people might want that. But if we want to really wow our guests, possibly um, maybe Brady, if we could show some of these pictures and David could kind of talk about some of the details in these out outdoor events. Here's one. So perfect. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, like Ken said, outdoor events is probably going to be a preference for a while if possible. Um, so here locally, we're heading right into summer, which is great. Um, but that's not going to be the case for everyone or possible for everybody. But I think the point that I want to drive home to our audience today is that as you can tell by some of these pictures of events we've produced um, from different locations that you know the the reason why we say size doesn't matter is because the experience factor in these kinds of events 
uh, is such that it really envelops the guest into something that is interesting, it's special, it's customized, and it really uh, gives them the sense that they are there to enjoy an experience. And that is with every layer of detail. And it includes things like not only menu, but entertainment and look and feel and lighting and everything that's associated with these kinds of, of more intimate experiences. And I think one of the biggest challenges, I know that we, the three of us have talked a lot about this, is that there are other things that we need to think about moving forward. Um, and some of it, which I know we're going to get into, is about um, you know, a little bit more physical distancing to be considered in locations, but it all boils down to things about sanitation and food and beverage service and um, wait staff. There's so many different layers now that even though intimate in these examples, they are gonna have to be factored in. We're all gonna have to have good plans for it. And um, there's ways to creatively introduce those new parameters into these kinds of events. So um, I just encourage people that when we are thinking about how to sell these types of experiences that we do not shy away from the complexity and the number of sales opportunities that there are um, to, to be able to just meet their expectation, but beyond that, really create something super special um, with these kinds of, of details and, and uh, experience signature factors, those kinds of things. Yeah. One of the questions uh, from our viewers is, um, and kind of like you mentioned briefly about, you know, a guest care station, you know, is that something that we're going to need to develop? And Ken, you were talking about that yesterday, sourcing the hand sanitizer, but um, Jessica is asking specifically, um, is have you guys thought about charging some sort of sanitation or PPE charge, you know, sur or surcharge on your bill? Um, is that some or Ken for you? You know, is there going to be extra steps for rental equipment that you're going to have to, you know, do back at your warehouse? Is that something that is going to be a surcharge? You know, well, or what are your thoughts with that? Not only are we going to have fire extinguishers in every one of the tents, but now we're going to have to have sanitizer stations mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and somebody to service those things. Yeah. So there's there's a great opportunity for that, but that's all part of things that have to be talked about and, and planned out and how it's all going to work. So do you think it'd be fair to say that you know to charge? you know, as surcharge if they're buying 10 things, a hand sanitizer? Or oh, no question yeah, about okay, it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. That's I, and I think overall, Michael, that's something too that people, you know, should be expecting that there are going to be charges related to um, some of this new experience that is going to be required. Um, and I think that that's going to be really important to be transparent and honest about upfront. Um, but I also think that there are going to be some things that might not necessarily be able to pa be passed through to the client that are just going to have to be the new norms of doing business, um, mm -hmm. which is you know another piece of it. But there definitely are going to be costs involved that need to be passed to the client, and and they need to be aware of that quickly. I think for yep. sure, definitely a lot of great questions too. We'll get back to them in a little bit here. Um, I want to talk specifically about the layout. You know, we talked about creating lighting, decor, um, or even lighting, obviously, to kind of break up the room or make it feel more intimate. Um, Ken, do you have, I mean, and Brady, you could probably throw this up too, but could you, what, if I want to have a tented event space, what does that look like, you know, today? It's not just four, you know, tabletops. So Ken, if you could kind of walk through, you know, what you're thinking uh, here, we'll put your screen up. Well, here. what I tried, what I tried to do there is just give the same size tent with a little bit different layout in, uh, in social di distancing. Every one of the little squares that has a table is a 12 foot diameter square or a 12 foot square. And I've put a tent in there and, and it tells you uh, the first tent, it, it can have uh, 100 and uh, whatever it is, yeah. 60, 60 people or 65 yeah, people. 64, or 50. Yeah, 64, yeah. So you have the opportunity of, of some doing some kind of variety with it and it doesn't have to be all tables of six or eight or whatever the case may be but you if you start out with with what size and, and how you can get it into that tent or the, that, that size of tent um, you can do just about anything so Ken for those who aren't maybe involved in the layout phase of this what if I wanted a tent for you know 50 60 people here you have it looks like it's a 30 by 60 you know, last summer, if we had a party for 50 to 60 people, a sit down dinner like you showed, what, what size tent would that be in? Uh, probably if I wanted to get that yeah. dance floor in there, it would be a 40 by 60. 
Jeez. And then I would have it all in one tent. All in one tent. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but you'd, cr you'd, you'd make the tables without yeah. all the yeah. distance. Yeah. And Michael, you know, this, these diagrams are super helpful from Ken, and they really visually explain, um, especially as it relates to tenting. But I know a lot of our colleagues, too, are really super concerned about, okay, we have events booked, but now we have a ballroom with four walls. And if we need to be considerate of this new format of physical distancing when it comes to laying out and seating, what do we do? We, yeah. we have only this amount of space. So that's a challenge for people, too. I, I think related to... Um, what Ken was presenting in his drawings. Another new thing to think about for those of us in the wedding industry as well. I think that you're going to see um, some very interesting, more like stand-up style ceremonies, mm -hmm. allowing guests to kind of have their own space, mm -hmm. you know, how they're comfortable, not rows and rows of chairs perhaps. Um, so I think that that's going to be a little bit more flexible too. Uh, but I do know that uh, especially especially right now, figuring out what your diagrams and your capacities can be in your different spaces within your venue is really, really critical to yeah. formulating a path for you to move forward. And I think uh, your friends at AFR had sent you some examples too of what they might look in interior as well. You know. It, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, for those of us that have meetings and corporate events coming up, you know, a meeting room that might, or boardroom that might hold, have hold 14 people now can only maybe mm -hmm. have seven. You know, again, how do we help that client with different space? How can you creatively use your spaces? But these diagrams from AFR definitely give us some good examples of how different meeting areas or breakout spaces or lounge areas can still be really well detailed, designed, and beautiful in presentation and comfortable for people. But you might need to be able to do this in some of your common spaces now that you don't have as much meeting space, perhaps, based on some of these new rules. Yeah. No, I agree. And it's just the, the details are everything. You know, it's like you have to think of everything that you're getting for a couple reasons. One, you know, people are going to be a little, you know, apprehensive in the immediate future to attend an event. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about them being comfortable, but make them feeling feel wow. You know, I mean, like I mentioned, I've I've actually been able to attend some of uh, these small intimate events that David's produced. And I mean, it's everything, you know, it's 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 everything down to the detail, the nameplate, you know, the China, the silverware, the timeline of the event is another way that you can interact with people, you know, giving them in different spaces and different activities throughout the night. I mean, really makes a difference. Um, Back to some uh, questions. Michael, oh, yeah, I was, was yeah, going to say related to that too. You know, so one of the things I'm excited about is for th the places where you have the space available. I'm excited about what I'm calling like the choose your own adventure party mm -hmm. where, you know, not everyone has to be together the whole time and you can have different things going on in different places, different entertainment, different interaction. And I think, you know, that's going to be fun to create. I really, I think uh, that kind of what I'm calling choose your own adventure is going to be a super fun party to do. I agree. All right. So question. This is a great question um, from Whitney. And she's saying, what about, you know, vendor to vendor? And I didn't even think about this. So it's a great question, Whitney. But OK, so we're on site. And all of us, you know, obviously have worked very closely on multiple events together. How is the vendor to vendor relationship going to change? You know, um, is it going to have to be, you know, OK, canopies, you know, when we're setting up together, our, our employees know each other so well that, I mean, we're practically helping set up tables and chairs and Ken's practically helping set up lighting and sound. Um, but, you know, is that going to have to change? You know, do you guys see that maybe Ken, you know, you're going to get four hours in the gym and when you're done, we're going to enter. Do you think that, you know, timelines for the pre setup might be something that changes? I don't, th I don't think that'll be an issue at all. I mean, we work together in, in all the time. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that's an issue. Cool. I, I think it only becomes an issue if there are places that we go that have a rule or a parameter around it. Um, you know, we, we are going into people's houses, um, whether it's a hotel that, you know, we don't work at or someone's personal house. But, you know, we're going to have to, um, as vendor partners, understand and and know what people's um, policies and procedures might be because the the chance that it's going to be the same across the board is probably not realistic mm -hmm. um, what i'm hoping is that it's interim and that it's not going to be a forever thing um, so I, I just think it's going to be kind of 
different here and there and we're going to have to just work yeah. together and like I said in the first question this boils down to setting expectations and communication. I don't think there's going to be any change in, in the time limits and we're it, well it, it, maybe maybe there are maybe it's going everything is going to get a little tighter because the rooms are going to be used on Friday and Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday mm -hmm. um, and it, it's just going to have to happen but that's that's something that we've been dealing with the whole time it's just how to how to communicate it and how to how to make it work if indeed we're in different rooms audio and visual is going to come into play yeah. dramatically more uh, if if indeed we're going from one house to the other house or whatever the case may be um, you're going to have to communicate that and maybe maybe video from one location goes to the other location it's everything is going to change yeah. but i think that's exciting <laughs> um so. somebody's asking is there a concern, you know, what if we don't, they're saying, what if we don't get back to person? Um, you know, are there any best ways that you can do some of these unique experiences, but in a virtual way? I mean, <laughs> and I know we all have a different opinion. Let's on try that. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what? The, it's not that it's not going to get back to in-person events. People People are craving it. We know that. Uh, people thrive on it. And there is nothing better than the personal interaction. And even when it comes to networking, team building, relationship building, and celebration, there is nothing that will ever be better than the in-person. So that's that. Yep. And um, I do think what we have a challenge of is that although things, the phone's starting to ring again and things are starting to happen, and we know that there's, they're going to be different for a while. Um, the biggest thing is, and this is just me personally, I don't have a crystal ball, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that it is going to be a while until our industry is fully back and running in terms of what we're used to, in terms of our rough and rigorous and fast-paced uh, way of doing things, you know, that's still going to be a progression. And we know that because a lot of our friends and colleagues, unfortunately, are laid off and furloughed and people are adjusting right now. And it's going to take a while to ramp back up on all different levels. So yeah. that's just kind of the reality. But the in-person, I mean, it's yeah, going to be going. going away. <laughs> um, Claudia, so on that note, Claudia is asking, um, so is it smart for the foreseeable future to, and we briefly touched about this earlier, to have some sort of hybrid event? Um, do you think, especially for our corporate and nonprofit events, do you need to provide some sort of web streaming or virtual option that either A, people might not feel comfortable or might not be healthy enough to travel, um, or B, is that something, if I'm a nonprofit or corporate organization, that I need to be kind of planning all along to have a virtual option? Thoughts on that? I definitely think, I, I don't know, Ken, but I definitely think that it is going to be now a part of what we do. Mm -hmm. I think that the hybrid nature of our events and incorporating technology even more, uh, we have all now learned so much um, in this process. And I think that the virtual aspect provides opportunities, especially in the case maybe for our nonprofit organizations that we help um, to add a component of ways to make additional money or to fundraise more money. There's great ways to incorporate virtual aspects into in-person events in the future that only enhance. You know, it shouldn't be looked at as a piece that um, t does something in, in, you know, to take something away to make that happen. I just think it's a part of it. Yeah. Um, and I think we've learned so much that it could be a very good part of what yeah. we do moving forward. And I, and I think that's what's happened as so many of fundraisers have gone to for this for this area of time of, of society um, that there is a certain element that is going to continue that way and then if you mold those two together mm -hmm. it's just like David says I think that's going to be an enhancement for yeah. the fundraising. Ken, a couple questions specific to kind of the rental industry. One person's asking, you know, or Corinne's asking, what's the deal with the dance floor? You know, what, what are we going to do? You know, uh, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so that and then the second another person, uh, Emily, was asking, what's the future of soft seating or lounge areas, you know, intimate lounge areas? Do you have any thoughts on either of those items? Fabrics that uh, fabrics that uh, can be lend themselves to during do the that. Event. Yes, yeah. that mm -hmm. you can yeah. clean them down. Yeah. And dance floor? Is, am I going to be able to do the electric slide ever again at a, at a wedding? Or? Let, <laughs> that, well, that one we're all going to find out about. Okay, so 
a lot of different options. But yeah, there are a lot of dis yeah. different options and, and how, we, how it comes about. We're all on a learning curve right now. Yeah. There's no question in my mind. Yeah. Um, I, I think the key to that is, you know, because we don't know, and the dance floor question comes up probably every <laughs> single day, yeah. uh, multiple times, um, and it's a big, big question. Um, so I think that it's going to be just staying on top of what happens day to day from now moving forward because eventually we're going to have an answer. Um, but in the meantime, we have to help each other best understand what will work in each environment. And again, some of it's going to mean, look, if you want to have a party, you know, soon in this venue, this is the space we have to work mm -hmm. with. We need to fit this many people. That might not end up being an option because you, you might not have the necessary space or it might be an option, but it might not be um, for, you know, all on dancing. It yeah. might just be a form of entertainment. Which to bring it back to our title today, you know, one of the benefits of doing a smaller event, you know, with, with 50 some people is you could possibly still have the ability to do some of these things. You know, to, you, you can, instead of having everybody go to a bar, you can have wait service, you know, where people are giving people an individual drink. Um, and it's 50 people on a dance floor instead of 250. So it still allows you to do that. One of the things, David, you mentioned too, um, maybe don't look at it as ways of, oh, how do we fix the dance floor? You know, maybe music is, maybe you should switch to different entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe instead of after your corporate dinner and you have a band, maybe you bring in a comedian, mm -hmm. you know, that people can sit in their own space and enjoy the comedian and still have a great time, you know, spend good money on the comedian. Um, looking in different ways as well. Michael, I think one of the best examples of that is we, um, all of us did an event, um, I think at the Shrine, Triple I Shrine, mm -hmm. Um, and created a whole cabaret and honestly, you know, it was seated entertainment, but it was one of the best examples of event entertainment. Um, and there was probably six different acts incorporated into the cabaret and people left that event talking about it for, I mean, I still hear about it and it's a couple years later. Um, so yeah, I think entertainment is an area where there's a lot of possibility and flexibility, but right now it's not going to be 150 people on a dance floor for what we know right now today. Mm -hmm. um, this is a specific question. Somebody's asking, you know, how far out are you looking to do a, tr and we each can answer this, a traditional, you know, wedding. Um, would you say September, October, you know, I, I can go first, you know, just for me. For us, we're seeing um, <laughs> events kind of in a more traditional, you know, form, uh, I would say August is kind of what we're seeing for some of our events. Um, September and October, certainly, you know, people are doing, and again, using some of those different trip or tricks that we talked about and spreading people out. But that's uh, for me. I don't know if you guys have anything thoughts on that and when a traditional wedding might take place. We're both sitting here like, <laughs> okay, this is a circle of trust, yeah, right? right. <laughs> we, yeah, us and our we get two hundred to viewers, assign yeah. a circle of trust, <laughs> right? Um, I, you know, to, for me to be completely transparent, you know, I think that there's a difference. Um, in terms of the level of event, the size and scope of an event, the location of the event, and the type of event. You know, I, um, you know, my market and my customer is in the luxury marketplace. So for me, it's a, it might be a little bit different because um, to be completely transparent and honest, you know, some clients just aren't up for having to be somewhere where waitstaff is wearing masks and bartenders are wearing masks and gloves and they have to um, sit at a four top instead of an eight top and things have to be done differently in terms of managing food and beverage and maybe a bento box of hors d'oeuvres. Like some people just aren't up for it right now. And so they're, they're, they're moving until they're thinking it's very certain, which is in um, the spring and summer of 2021. There definitely are things happening at the end of this summer, fall and winter, but um, there's, a, there's a whole segment of people, and I know we've all experienced it, that for one reason or another just want to wait until there's more certainty yep. for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and yeah, you can't that's okay. Them. Yeah, you can't blame <laughs> Well, that would be my thought also. Okay. It's, uh, we're not going to come back to normal in this, in this calendar year at all. Okay. But I, in my opinion, are there going to be weddings? Are there going to be parties? Absolutely. That, that'll happen. But it's not going to come back to what where it was. It was. Before. 
Cool. Now maybe in maybe in the spring or the winter. Uh, I don't know yeah. of next year. And I think one of the things that I've said the previous, and I know I'm Mr. Optimistic, but it, two months ago we were all living our lives, you know. So it's I don't think any of us had the crystal ball, and there's no reason to say two months from now it can't change the other way. Um, one more question, then we'll go to Grunts here to see the finished product. Um, if you guys can kind of rapid fire these because we have a lot of questions. Um, any particular events for uh, locally in Milwaukee, somebody's asking specific venues for these smaller intimate events that either of you have really quick? Wow, Names I mean, there's right. so many, but I think the problem right now is that um, yeah. many of them aren't open <laughs> and have not released a yeah. date of when they're gonna open again. So I know that they're, um, you know, for us locally, I know that there's at least a good tracking of like hotel openings um, on Visit Milwaukee's website. Um, but the problem is right now, people have not released um, their standard policies. So we need people to make choices, to make decisions, and to put them in place so that we know what those parameters and um, situations are particular to each venue. And we need to know when um, people are going to start opening so that we can, you know, kind of guide people. Because we have a city full of small, beautiful, intimate places. We, we yeah. really do. Ken, do you have any favorites? Oh, yeah, I've got some favorites. Or, but, uh, <laughs> I agree. This one I really, really agree with. Uh, what, three, four months ago, we were talking about uh, spaces that could hold 375, mm. 400, or whatever the case may be. Well, now we've completely flipped around. The person that has a small venue, uh, an exciting venue, a little yeah. trendy unique, venue, yeah. unique. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna flourish, Definitely. in my opinion, from now to the end of the year. Uh, views are asking that she has an outdoor event, uh, September 11th and 12th, kind of outdoor music, um, going through, you know, tra it's an outdoor traveling museum, outdoor beer garden. Um, what are my odds of this being a doable event? My vote is pretty good because it's outdoors and it's a lot of... How many people things. is the question? It, they did not say how many people. Angie did not say that. But so much depends on what what uh, what the restrictions are going to be in the coming months. Yep. The fear factor, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to continually project that we're going to have a surge in the fall? Yeah. If if somebody comes out yeah, and says everything. that, yeah, yeah, then it's everything. It, it, it's, I, it's a problem. I say a good predictor is to watch sports. Yep. What happens in the sports world is going to have a huge influence on what we do. And what happens in entertainment is going to have a huge influence on how special events come back. So, you know, I'm keeping my eye on those two industries and those two segments of our um, world because I think they're going to predict a lot for us. Yeah. Uh, David's asking about an event in the fall with Expo. That might be a future uh, webinar here talking about that. Um, but so we'll try to answer all your questions. Our team's typing them, so they will type answers because we're wrapping up here. Really quick, we want to go to. Uh, Design with Dan, our director of fabrication, um, Dan Grunts, to see our finished product, what we all can look forward to making home. Oh my gosh, Dan, you work so well. Wow. Great. Aren't I fast? Look at that. That's <laughs> <laughs> um, beautiful. Painted, framed, uh, antiqued. Uh, I don't do shiny and new, so it's got a little bit of a, a glaze on it. And I'm feeling particularly patriotic these days, so I did a little uh, oh, wow. whirly so gig too. left, right. <laughs> Republican, Democrat. Sometimes I feel like that's all they do is flip a coin so yep. <laughs> to make their decisions. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, thank you all for joining us. We will send out information on our next uh, The Show Must Go On as well. And actually, one of our panelists, David, is launching a web series as well. So make sure to tune into that on his, fa on his corporate Facebook page. Uh, again, you can find it by Events by DC on Facebook. And his first guest, I believe, is tomorrow already at 2 p.m. Central Time. So make sure to check that out as well. Um, stay safe, everybody. Um, really keep in touch. We will feel free to email us. Check us out on Facebook, Magic Productions, uh, magicpro.com. And we will do our best to answer all these questions. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you, David. Thank you, Ken, for coming on. Uh, it's weird not being there with you, um, <laughs> but uh, very fun to have you as well. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Well. Take care.